Recently, the Canadian First World War Internment Recognition Fund was announced, and articles have been appearing in papers across the country. On the line now is the person who is largely responsible for starting the process that led to the creation of this fund, Dr. Lubomir Litsuk. Thanks so much for joining us, Lubomir. Oh, thank you, Paulette. My pleasure. Now, um, tell us uh, what this um, in this fund is all about. Well, it's the uh, culmination, frankly, of uh, more than a quarter of a century of work on the part of uh, a, you know a small band of sisters and brothers across the country, uh, mainly people who were involved with the Ukrainian Canadian Civil Liberties Association, but others as well in the Ukrainian Canadian Congress and just freelancers, if you were, who uh, lobbied the government of Canada successfully finally, um, to recognize that during Canada's first national internment operations in 1914 to 1920, thousands of Ukrainians and other Europeans were unjustly interned, forced to do heavy labor for the profit of their jailers, uh, sent into confinement in remote centers, uh, distant from their you know, home communities, and so on. Um, I'm sure your listeners are generally familiar with what happened, but mm-hmm. let me recap, uh, literally thousands Ukrainians and other Europeans were branded enemy aliens uh, at the outbreak of the First World War, not because of any wrongdoing on their part, but only because of who they were and where they had come from. And that was in the main from Halachina, Galicia, and Kovina, territories then under the control of the Austro Hungarian Empire. So these people came to Canada, lured here with promises of freedom and free land, bearing Austro Hungarian passports. And that was the problem. When the war broke out, the British Empire found itself at war with. Germany, the German Empire, the Ottoman Turkish Empire, the Austro Hungarian Empire, and here you have literally tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people who come from the Austro Hungarian Empire. Now, uh, in the context of the wartime hysteria and xenophobia, there was a call for the internment of these so called aliens. The War Measures Act that would be later used against the Japanese, Canadians, and even the Quebec Law in 1970 was passed, and the internment operations. Yeah, they lasted until June of 1920, so actually several uh, years after the war's end. Mm-hmm. And in that context, um, people were scooped up, put into these internment camps in places like Nanaimo and Banff and Jasper and Edgewood and Fort Henry here in Kingston, Spirit Lake in Quebec, Amherst, Nova Scotia, right across the country, and lost what little wealth they had. Some of it was returned during the course of their confinement or when they were released, but some was held back by the government of Canada. So this was a really, you know, frankly, a crippling blow to our community in its early formative stages. And frankly, in my view, personal view, it's it's, it's an argument to be made that I don't think our community ever fully recovered from it. Mm -hmm. Uh, People were embarrassed, afraid, they didn't want to talk about it. Survivors were uh, traumatized. They, They often refused to tell their own children about what happened. And so reconstructing the historical memory of that experience uh, was a long and difficult process. There were people along the way who played an instrumental role in, in doing that. Of course, both Don Cordon at the University of Saskatchewan now was one of the key players. Uh, John Gregorovich, who was the chairman of the Civil Liberties Commission and later the Ukrainian Canadian Civil Liberties Commission, uh, was the guy that sort of uh, began the charge. And, you know, as you pointed out, uh, for some reason, even though I have no personal connection to this, I was uh, the guy that thought this was an important historic injustice that needs to be righted, and I carried it forward. And I'm very pleased that, uh, to, to report that in May of 2008, the government of Canada reached a settlement with the Ukrainian Canadian community, as represented by Kuk and the Shevchenko Foundation and the club. Uh, Ten million dollars was granted to the community in the form of an endowment that is managed by the Ukrainian Canadian Foundation of Shevchenko in Winnipeg. The current president being Denise Ladyshelsky from Edmonton. The interest earned on that $10 million will then be used for the next 15 years to fund projects that commemorate or educate or otherwise recall what happened to Ukrainians and the other affected communities during Canada's first national internment operation. So it's a very inclusive fund held by the Shevchenko Foundation. There's an oversight committee, of course, of financial managers and planners, but there's also an endowment council comprised of several representatives of the Ukrainian Canadian community, a descendant of the internees, and the person of Fran Haskett, 
and members representing other affected communities, in this case specifically so far the Croatian, Hungarian, and Serbian communities. Mm -hmm. So we have a really kind of a neat council, an endowment council, that um, and now we just, it has for a year. Of course, none of us could have anticipated the financial meltdown <laughs> that yeah. in the last year. So that $10 million that we were granted uh, or given as symbolic restitution right. dropped uh, by over a million dollars. It's now come back, more or less. Uh, we were able to fund some projects like the Spirit Lake Camp Corporation received funding to develop an interpretive center in the Abitibi region of Quebec. We helped fund uh, Jojo's Secret, a film by Toronto filmmaker uh, James Montluc. Uh, we have now just finished launching uh, the new Canadian First World War Term Recognition Fund website. I invite your listeners to go to www.internmentcanada.ca. Great. And they can find the application forms there. They can find our first annual report there. Um, and some information already has reported in the press about what we've begun to do. But really, officially, in a way, we, we launched just this past weekend, September the 12th, and we sent out thousands of postcards and thousands of postcards across the country uh, with the assistance of members of Parliament like Boris Rusnowski and James Bazan and, and, of course, Senator Andrejchuk. Uh We've been sending out these cards and posters to libraries and universities so that people will see how they can uh, apply for a grant. Now, I want to emphasize that the, the grants are based on the interest earned on the principal, so people should you know, figure that we will be working with somewhere in the order of three to four hundred thousand dollars a year in terms of grant monies available, um, less some modest administrative costs. Um, the grants are inclusive, so any Canadian organization or individual can apply. You don't have to be Ukrainian to be, you know, uh, Scottish Jamaican for our, for all we care, you know, as long as you are doing a project that relates specifically to uh, the internment operations. So this is not a fund that will fund uh, building projects or the re reconstruction of halls or dance groups that promote Ukrainian culture or Croatian culture, for that matter, or Serbian uh, poetry reading or anything like that. It is a uh, fund that is specifically dedicated to the commemoration of that particular experience and its impact on the affected community. So people have to understand that, first of all, and it's based on the principle, uh, the interest earned on the principle, so it's not 10 million people have some people said, oh, well, we need $3 million here or we need $1 million there. Mm -hmm. um, grants will be given out on the basis of merit. Um, grants will be given out on the basis of serious applications that are tabled by individuals or organizations that follow the procedures outlined on the website. And again, that website is www.internmentcanada.ca. 